concludes the morning, se uh, the morning session here, but I have a, a slightly special introduction to make uh, for our speakers, Jeff Bezanson and Stefan Korspinski, who are both two of the core developers of the Julia language that some of you may have heard about, um, and uh, they asked me to explicitly say that they're not crashing our party, we invited them. I actually contacted them <laughs> uh, a couple of months ago and said, hey guys, there's a lot of overlap in ideas, and, but, but there's also a lot of interesting things that you guys are doing with Julia, and I think it would be a very productive discussion if you came and gave a, a really technical talk on some of the problems that, that you're addressing with Julia and some of the, the approaches that you can take when you have the freedom of a new language, and please come, give a really technical talk, and I'm sure it'll be a very productive discussion. So I'm really happy that they took me up on the offer and that we have them here, so. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Stefan Karpinski. This is Jeff Bazanson. Um, we created Julia with uh, two of our collaborators, uh, Varal Shah and Alan Edelman, who couldn't be here today, but I think two of us is enough. Um, if anyone saw Travis Oliphant's talk on Numba just now downstairs, we actually have a lot of common goals, um, the Julia project and the Numba, and we're in the unusual position of being ahead of a Python project in terms of development. So that. That's a, that's a turnaround, but um, the standard compromise that's come, come to exist in which some uh, SciPy and NumPy and all of Python, in fact, it, you know, is an in instance of is this uh, two-tier architecture to address the compromise between performance and convenience. You know, we know convenience is winning. Uh, everybody's here because they like using a high-level dynamic language to do their scientific computing. Um, but C and Fortran are still the gold standard for performance. So what you do is you end up writing your high-level stuff in something nice and convenient like Python, um, and you end up doing all the heavy lifting in C or Fortran. Uh, so this is pragmatic for a lot of applications, but it does have drawbacks. So for example, we would prefer to write uh, our low-level code in something convenient as well. Um, it forces vectorization. Uh, you know, the, this is, vector, vectorized code is actually convenient for a lot of linear algebra stuff, but there's also situations where you just want to write a loop. And it would be nice if that loop was as fast as it was in C, C or Fortran. Actually, you've got to stand back. Sorry. Um, it, uh, you know, there's, there's, if any of you have written any of the, you know, in, written internals inside of SciPy or NumPy, um, there's, a, there's a lot of complex mediation. You have two type systems, you have two garbage collection schemes, and you have to work between them, and it gets to be very, com it's harder than writing either C or Python. Um, there's some overhead. Uh, there's also a big social barrier. So, you know, if you're just a user of SciPy, that's kind of okay, because you don't ever have to get into the internals, but it prevents you from getting into the internals. If the internals were also written in Python, you could get to, you could, tinker around with them. You could see how they work. You could understand why something does or doesn't perform well. Um, so these days, there are fast dynamic languages. So PyPy is one good example that's pretty well known. Um, you can get Python. There, there are issues with using Python for scientific computing. It's incompatible with C Python and its APIs. But you can get Python to run fast in a lot of instances. LuaJIT is another pretty famous example. It's an incredibly good fast JIT for, uh, for a dynamic language. Um, and of course, JavaScript V8 runs very close to C, C performance on a lot of code. Um, so our question, and one of the reasons why we set out on this project is, you know, what all of these have in common that they took an existing dynamic language that was designed to be interpreted and tried to make them faster. Well, what happened if you took our advanced knowledge, the fact that we now know how to make a dynamic language run fast and designed a dynamic language to take maximal advantage of that? Um, and while you're at it, maybe we can provide a little additional expressiveness. So this is, this is Julia's approach in a nutshell. Uh, we want something that's fast, primarily fast. I mean, that's the really the, the end all be all. It has to be compiled speed. Um, fast, but also dynamic, because that's convenient, and it gives you a sense of tangibility. You know, you're actually touching the objects, almost, um, and expressive. So the core design principle of the language is generic functions, which is uh, also known as multiple dispatch. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. In, 
Traditional OO, you can only dispatch on the receiver of a message. Uh, multiple dispatch, you apply a function to its arguments, and it it what what implementation gets called actually depends on all of the argument types. Um, there's a rich type system, so. We, we expose a type system to the user. You don't have to use it. You can write completely untyped code, and it'll also be fast. But if you feel like talking about types, you can. Um, and the speed allows a lot of Julia to be written in itself. Uh, there's a very, very tiny core in C, but it's like 10,000 10, lines of code or something like that. Um, the rest of everything is just written in Julia, which allows you to, to mess around with it, see how it works, change it um, easily. So we use LLVM for code generation, but this isn't a silver bullet. Um, you, you, you do need to generate good code for LLVM to work with in order for LLVM to give you speed. If you just generate you know, a very untyped and not very tight code for LLVM to optimize, you still won't get performance. Um, our type inference is not Hindley-Milner, if that means anything to anyone here. OK. So. Jeez, sorry about this. OK, so one question that may occur to people is why types? Like, we're, we, like we like dynamic languages. We don't, we don't want to have to mess around with types. We like being able to write code that just you know, it's, takes A and B and adds them regardless, you know, based on their value. Um, and the answer is that there are always types. So even in, quote, untyped languages, you, you're actually working with typed values. You just don't have a way of talking about types. And so our approach is to let you continue to write code that doesn't explicitly talk about types if you don't want to. But there are cases where you inevitably end up talking about types. And you see this in NumPy a lot, right? You have typed arrays. And now Python doesn't provide a good way to talk about the fact that something is a double. You end up having to use strings in a, in a, in a weird way to talk about you know, what the type of things is. And this is common in dynamic languages. That's just sort of a general issue. Um, and fast implementations, as it turns out, always have sophisticated type systems, because they have to reason about these things in order to be able to generate code that's good. And so our, one of our ideas is, you know, well, why not just expose that? We, we're going to have a type system. Why not make it really good and fairly sophisticated? Let the compiler use it, but also let the programmer use it, if they want to. Uh, OK, so here's just to give you a sense of what Julia looks and feels like, here's a, a couple of you know, code examples. Uh, here's an implementation of a quick sort function. Uh, as you can see, there are no types mentioned anywhere. It's kind of like, you know, like Ruby or Python code would look. Um, A is an array, you have low high indices, and you just do your usual stuff. And you have, you know, low level bit twiddling, you have loops. All of this runs at C code. This is our actual benchmark code, and it runs at C speed. Um, Here's an example of something a little more medium level. And this is more medium level because it's more at the level that you would be writing for, say, you know, NumPy or MATLAB, where you have vectorized operations. Create a couple of uh, vectors of zeros. You create some random num matrices, uh, n by n. You concatenate them in a couple of different ways. And then you compute some matrix powers and take traces. And you iterate through this. Um, this is an interesting, this is also a benchmark we use. Uh, this is an interesting benchmark because the objects are small enough that you don't get enough leverage from having, uh, using an LA pack core to actually get really good performance in, in you know, NumPy or MATLAB or something like that. Um, so being able to generate good, good native code all the way to up and down the stack is really important for this sort of thing. Um, so here's some high-level code. Uh, this gives you, this shows off one of, one of the, you know, the core features, which is uh, multiple dispatch. So um, you see those colon, colon, colon annotations. That marks the type of something. So this code actually is the code we use to implement our distributed arrays, um, which we use for, for you know, large-scale large parallel computing on, across multiple machines. Uh, and it begins by synchronizing across the machines. Then you see that spawn at line. Basically, what that says is, I want you to do this local operation at processor P. And then it calls another copy to. That copy to is something like this bottom function, which is for a local array. And it just does a simple loop. 
Um, and as you can see, our loops are just implemented fairly simply in Julia itself, and that you know that runs at native speed. Um, for this kind of thing, though, you actually want to use something like LAPack because they're heavily tuned. So we'll have even another method in there that will that will be called for things that can run in LAPack. Um, So I'm going to hand it over to Jeff here. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm Jeff. Uh, I'm going to take over the talk. Uh, so. I want to go back a little bit and just just say something about uh, <clears throat> this kind of this kind of high level uh, untyped code of the kind you could write in MATLAB or or Python. But sort of the thing to notice about it is it's uh, it's kind of client it's API client code essentially. It's uh, it's basically a, it's a consumer of, of definitions. It's it's using definitions that other people have set up. Uh, like when you have a you know a star operator or a plus operator, there's a lot of complexity and a lot of stuff happening inside those operators. And here you're just sort of using them. You're not really specifying how things work. You're just kind of using it. And so the, the real difference um, in, the, in, in our approach is that we pay a lot of attention to uh, mechanisms for declaratively defining how things work. And, and that lets the compiler piece things together very well. Um, so, and the key to that, uh, to me, is really this, the, the multiple type-based dispatch paradigm. Uh, because, it, and I think multiple dispatch ends up being kind of clever because it lets you sort of collect a lot of uh, type information that's not redundant information. Uh, because when you when you put these dispatch specifications on function arguments, it's not redundant information. It's not a it's not a declaration. It's not just telling the the language that oh by the way this thing is an int. It's a, it's 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 a dispatch specification. It's saying when this argument is an integer, call this function. So it's not redundant. So that that way I find you know psychologically people sort of don't mind writing these types because it's sort of telling it it's telling the system how the thing works. It's not uh, it's not redundant information. Uh, so for example, here's how we specify some of the behaviors of some of our operators, uh, like plus on two int sixty fours. Uh, it basically you know comes down to you know machine instruction uh, effectively. Uh, so that's that's how, and we just have lots and lots of definitions like this. Uh, it's all all written in Julia, uh, and then we also have, for example, a numeric promotion mechanism. Uh, it's also defined in Julia using you know type-based dispatch, uh, and that basically you know you, you give it two numbers and it promotes them to a common type and, and gives you something back. Uh, so then you can do things like this, uh, where I can say if I have plus on on two numbers and I only know that they're numbers. Uh, I can try promoting them. I can try calling promote and then trying the plus again. Uh, so you can, you know, define up all of these normally really, really low-level behaviors. You can you can define up out of this whole uh, dynamic dispatch scheme. Uh, and this gets this gets fancier. Uh, so if you want to you want to start specifying some some more fancy behaviors. Um, for example, uh, you know we have a whole universe of various arrays, and then there are some of those arrays that are special in that they are supported by you know libraries like BLAST and LAPAC. Uh, they have to have a certain memory layout, right? So we'd like to describe uh, that situation. So we can start by defining a type that basically encompasses the element types that LAPAC supports, uh, and then we can also define a a type that's uh, strided matrices. And that basically means um, either a contiguous dense array or some kind of a subarray of that. And we have this type subarray that actually was somebody else wrote. Uh, neither of us uh, was the one who wrote it. Uh, it was a summer student, actually, who, who implemented it. And it's basically a type that uh, just does index transformations uh, on top of some other array. So you can put any other kind of array under it. Uh, and and, and uh, it'll view a part of the array in a certain way, and it'll, it'll handle the index transformations. Um, so you know, it, it, it obviously isn't going to work with everything because you know uh, certain kinds of arrays have extremely different uh, layout and access time characteristics and that sort of thing. So if you know if 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 not every level of your abstraction stack there knows about those things, you can hit performance road bumps and, and things like that. But you know these things will work well on on dense local arrays, and you can put a distributed array underneath it too, and that will usually work pretty well. 
uh, as well. Uh, and this, so all, the things just compose together like that. Uh, and you know, so all, all the uh, all the operations on the subarray are just written basically as functions that transform indexes. And so the, you know, the, but the compiler can see all of those and when it can, when it can prove what the types are, it, it will put all those together and inline them and you can still get pretty, pretty fast uh, implementations a lot of the time. Um, so having defined those, those kinds of types, uh, I can now make a definition for star operator uh, where I, when, when I have some element type that's supported by laypack and then I have a strided matrix and a strided vector, then I know that I can call the blast uh, gemv function in there. And uh, so that basically encompasses that declarative information. And so this, you know, it, it's, uh, it's sort of, it's convenient for you because you just have to say, you know, when I see one of these kinds of arrays, please do this, and it's good for the compiler because when it knows what the types are, it can just dispatch directly to this without uh, going through any kind of, you know, runtime if statements or something. A uh, similar kind of thing for memset, where if I have a, I've got a fill operator, and if I happen to have a, an array of bytes uh, and some integer, then I can call memset. And so this is the full implementation in this case. So, so the advantage of this is that is the, uh, the, the kind of abstraction where you can build things, really people independently of each other, and the compiler composes them together uh, effectively. And, We've had people come along who are relatively new. I mean, the whole thing has only been announced for about six months, uh, so pretty much everyone is a new user. Uh, and people have come along and added really big, uh, you know, interesting chunks of functionality, and it didn't take that long. Uh, like somebody added bit arrays where they're, you know, packed one bit per element. Uh, someone just implemented that, and it, and it drops right in, and basically everything works. Uh, and like I said, someone, a summer student, wrote the subarray thing. Uh, people are working on library for modeling statistical distributions. Uh, and there's an R-like uh, data frame that's uh, work in progress. Uh, and it's particularly easy given this uh, sort of axiomatic style approach of, of defining things up uh, with these uh, all argument signatures. Uh, is it, it's easy to change really, uh, really low level behaviors uh, that are really difficult to change in other systems. Uh, like, the, like the arithmetic behaviors, uh, like I was talking about, um, and adding, adding new types that are essentially scalar representation. We have a, we have a feature that lets you uh, define a type whose representation is just a, a bit string. Uh, so as, as an example of this, so this is something that actually happened. Uh, at one point, uh, we were talking to people and somebody pointed out and said, hey, your, uh, your integer arithmetic behavior isn't really right. Uh, you're doing unsigned preserving and it should be value preserving. This is a, you know, a change in the way the integer arithmetic works, and we said, you're right, we should change that. And this slide is basically the entire patch. Uh, we'd, all we had to do was go through our uh, rules for type promotion on integers and just change which types to pick. And this was the entire diff, and then you just hit the, hit the button and uh, you know, rebuild the, the system base image, and you just get that behavior everywhere. That's, that's the whole change you need. Okay, so. Is this one? Yeah, okay. Just, just to clarify what's going on here, we're basically saying that, you know, if you combine an unsigned integer like an uint 60, you know, 16 with a, an int 64, now, previously we were saying we want an unsigned number, now we get a signed number. We just kind of change that systematically all over the place. And this, this is the entire change. So. Okay, uh, performance. <clears throat> These numbers are, are on our website, uh, and it's, it's, this is not something to read too deeply into. This isn't, this isn't a be-all and end-all exhaustive comparison. It really just says one thing, which is that, you know, the, the raw speed of code generation of, of you know, simple operations in, in various languages, and, uh, you know, R and MATLAB and, and Octave are kind of way up here, and this is a logarithmic scale, by the way. So, you know, we're, up here we're talking about factors of, of actually thousands. And it's, it's not application performance, it's, really, it's just a low-level looping performance. So it's... You'll, you'll, you'll note in here that uh, the furthest right benchmark is a highly vectorized thing, the kind of thing that NumPy was made for, right? And, num, and Python does great for that, right? Because here you have, you know, you, it, it, it's calling out to a C library and doing a really fast, doing a really fast job and not having a lot of overhead. MATLAB also does great. Um, Octave does well. Octave is usually terrible, but Octave does pretty well. Um, 
So that's the sort of thing that NumPy is great at. If you're, if you're doing things like actually just you know, writing in your language, shuffling around numbers, then it becomes much more difficult to get that kind of performance at a higher level. So that's, and, and interestingly, JavaScript does phenomenally well. Yeah, V8 JavaScript is very impressive. It's, uh, it's really, yeah, it's really amazing performance over here. It, uh, it actually beats us on one or two of these, I think. But we'll see what we can do about that. <laughs> Okay, so Julia and Python interoperability uh, is something we've kind of started thinking about a little bit. We haven't had time to really thoroughly address it, but we're thinking about it. Um, one thing we want to do is be able to statically compile Julia code into shared objects that you could then load from, uh, from Python and call using through the C ABI. Um, I think one, one advantage of having a language that's sort of designed uh, with the idea of type infants in mind from the beginning is you can do a better job of, of getting types without actually running the program. And you, even if you can't statically type everything, you'll probably get a lot more, and you'll be a, a lot more likely to, uh, to be able to get a good static compilation. Um, so that's something we want to do. Um, I think also uh, sharing on disk data formats. I mean, if, if, uh, if people have large data sets stored, you know, NumPy and, and Julia should be able to both access them. And so uh, you know, we're, we certainly want to be compatible with things like that. Uh, and we've, we, we did, uh, just, uh, we, we, just for the fun of it, we did quickly try calling uh, libpython from Julia. So we have, you know, since we can call C, we can, we can do that. Yeah, that. That took me about five minutes to figure out how to do, just like looking at libpython, and then it worked. It, it yeah, prints so, hello from Python. Yeah, so probably on top of that, we could, you know, with, a, with a little more work, we could make a, a nicer API within Julia for calling uh, Python things. And uh, well, here here's some reactions from people. Some people like it. Yeah, I think is that uh, we we've gotten positive responses. Uh, interestingly, our users seem to like really like Julia. MATLAB users. Um, do too. I think uh, SciPy users are pretty happy with what they have, but there's that whole there's that whole two language thing, which which makes it you know if you need to get into the guts of something, SciPy is more difficult. Julia maybe makes it easier. So, um, any questions? Oh. And since into the internals, but it prevents you from getting into the internals. If the internals were also written in Python, you could get to, you could tinker around with them. You could see how they work. You could understand why something does or doesn't perform well. Um, so these days, there are fast dynamic languages. So PyPy is one good example that's pretty well known. Um, you can get Python. There, there are issues with using Python for scientific computing. It's incompatible with C Python and its APIs. But you can get Python to run fast in a lot of instances. LuaJIT is another pretty famous example. It's an incredibly good fast JIT for, uh, for a dynamic language. Um, and of course, JavaScript V8 runs very close to C, C performance on a lot of code. Um, it forces vectorization. Uh, you know, the, this is vector, vectorized code is actually convenient for a lot of linear algebra stuff. But there's also situations where you just want to write a loop. And it would be nice if that loop was as fast as it was in C, C or Fortran. Actually, you've got to stand back. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's, if any of you have written any of the you know, in, written internals inside of SciPy or NumPy, um, there's, a, there's a lot of complex mediation. You have two type systems, you have two garbage collection schemes, and you have to work between them. And it gets to be very com It's harder than writing either C or Python. Um, there's some overhead. Uh, there's also a big social barrier. So, you know, if you're just a user of SciPy, that's kind of okay because you don't ever have to get. I'm really happy that they took me up on the offer and that we have them here. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, my name is Stefan Karpinski. This is Jeff Bazanson. Um, we created Julia with uh, two of our collaborators, uh, Varal Shah and Alan Edelman, who couldn't be here today, but I think two of us is enough. Um, if anyone saw Travis Oliphant's talk on Numba just now downstairs, we actually have a lot of common goals, um, the Julia project and the Numba, and we're in the unusual position of being ahead of a Python project in terms of development. So that, that's, a, that's a turnaround. But um, the standard compromise that's come, 
come to exist in which some uh, SciPy and NumPy and all of Python, in fact, it, you know, is an in instance of is this uh, two-tier architecture to address the compromise between performance and convenience. You know, we know convenience is winning. Uh, everybody's here because they like using a high-level dynamic language to do their scientific computing. Um, but C and Fortran are still the gold standard for performance. So what you do is you end up writing your high-level stuff in something nice and convenient like Python, um, and you end up doing all the heavy lifting in C or Fortran. Uh, so this is pragmatic for a lot of applications, but it does have drawbacks. So for example, we would prefer to write uh, our low-level code in something convenient as well. Includes the morning se uh, the morning session here, but I have a, a slightly special introduction to make uh, for our speakers Jeff Bezanson and Stefan Korspinski, who are both two of the core developers of the Julia language that some of you may have heard about, um, and uh, they asked me to explicitly say that they're not crashing our party. We invited them. I actually contacted them <laughs> uh, a couple of months ago and said, "Hey guys, there's." a lot of overlap in ideas, and, but, but there's also a lot of interesting things that you guys are doing with Julia, and I think it would be a very productive discussion if you came and gave a, a really technical talk on some of the problems that, that you're addressing with Julia and some of the, the approaches that you can take when you have the freedom of a new language, and please come, give a really technical talk, and I'm sure it'll be a very productive discussion. So uh, 